Hello guys, before I get into this fishing video, I just want to say that at the end of this video, there will be a short review for this thing, which is a pretty special smock that I'll be wearing in this video. I bought that a while ago, and it's exceptionally good, um, especially good for fishing. So please enjoy this video, and if you want to check the smock out, stay tuned right till the end. Hello there, welcome back. It's the end of May and on my local river there's a few mayflies hatching out. The reason I know that is because from my place I can see the river and there's a lot of gulls. They have suddenly appeared over the last week or so and they're diving and scooping and really attacking the mayfly. Now when the mayfly are coming out in earnest it really does attract the gulls. And I can hear fish rising all around me. I can't actually see many though, I've been sitting here for about five minutes. Every time I turn away, I hear something rise. So I'm just going to have a few speculative casts here. I'm using a grey wolf, which is a mayfly pattern. Difficult to get this damn thing in focus. There you go. Now that's a winged mayfly. It's quite a rough one, so it's suitable for use in turbulent water because it doesn't sink very well. And I've put some floating agent on as well, which is gink. And because it doesn't sink very well, it gives me the opportunity to skate this one across the surface. And sometimes that can induce a really violent take. But I'll have a few casts in here and we'll see what we can pull out. This is a really small setup, you know, seven foot rod, weight two, very, very light. But that's as big as you need on this little river. I see people coming down with like nine foot rods and all the chest waders and all that sort of nonsense. That's unbelievable. The amount of gear that some people have. Keep it simple. First cast into a fish. Greedy little bugger. This time of year, well in fact any time of year, you definitely need something to take the hook out of the fish. There you go, quick and easy little brown trout. They hit the fly so hard at this time of the year that they can often just inhale it. Now that one wasn't too far into the fish's mouth. But sometimes they literally just go like that, right in the back of the tongue. If you haven't got anything to get the fly out, the fish is pretty much knackered. So look after them. I've just spotted an adult mayfly on a rock. So for those of you not familiar with what a mayfly looks like, I'll zoom in and let you take a look. There you go. Now that fly has actually got a body approximately an inch and a half long. It's a really meaty meal for a trout, so you can understand why they go absolutely wild for them. Now the larvae of that fly lives in the mud in the bottom of the river uh, for about two or three years and then it comes out, changes from the larvae into the fly. Well, it goes through the pupa stage first, larvae, pupa, fly, and then it dances around, mates, lays eggs and dies. That's if it doesn't get eaten by the trout first. Just a little twitch. I don't know whether you saw the fish rise there, but that's all you need. Just a little twitch, just to get them interested. Okay, it started raining pretty heavy, so I'm going to get the camera covered up. And I'm going to make a move down a little bit further towards the bottom end of this pool. I will be quite visible, but now that it's raining, it's good because it breaks up the water surface. And when the fish is looking up for food, and also looking up for predators, i.e. me or a heron or something, creeping along the side of the riverbank. When it's raining, they have a very hard job seeing me. So that's a good time to go. Ah, that rain's put them right off. 
Gotta go down at the next pool. Right now, believe it or not, I've just seen a pretty good fish rise up here. It only looks about a foot deep, and it's not a very big runner. But if there's a fish in there, I'm gonna do my best to get it out. second cast. Right underneath the trees at the far side. Nice little brownie. Which is probably going to get off if it keeps, keeps jumping like that. <laughs> there you go. Lovely little brownie. Loads of red spots on it as well. A little wild one. There he goes. Put him back. And we'll catch him when he's a bit bigger. It's absolutely lashing down now. So I'm definitely gonna have to put this camera away, but I'll see you in the next pool. Okay, apologies if the sound is a little bit dodgy. I've got a plastic bag over the big fluffy microphone because it's still absolutely chucking it down. I'm in the top of a big long pool here. I haven't seen anything rise, but there's normally something oh, between here and that overhanging tree. And there's a kingfisher just gone past. Very good. Right, let's get this fly dried out and have a quick go in here. And as always, I start short and work my way into where I think there might be fish. Tiny little brownie. <laughs> there you go, son. That's why you should never just go along. I would have put the line straight over that one if I'd just gone long straight away. Always start short, work your way in. Brown trout though. Lovely little fish. Right, I'm going to try and get underneath the trees down there because I am absolutely wet through. And that camera is going to be knackered. Hopefully the camera will stay dry. I've got it tucked in underneath a tree. Alright, let's have a go down here. I've got practically no back cast here either. It's terrible. With a beautiful little brownie, I won't carry it up to show you because I'll probably fall over and make a fool of myself. He's going back as well. Great big fat belly on it. And moving on to the next pool. One just risen on the other side there. When I come to a new pool, 
I always just sit for a few minutes. Just watch what's happening, watch where the flies are moving, because if they're sitting on the water surface, they tend to just go with the current, and you'll notice that like two, two lots of current will go into one, or one will split off into two, there'll be submerged rocks, there'll be all sorts of features where the fish might hide or where they might use to their advantage because if you've got a couple of different flows coming into one that point where those different flows meet will bring all the food to the fish and that's probably where the fish are going to be the last thing I want to do is just charge up to the side of the river and just start lashing away because I'm never going to notice anything and the chances are I'm just going to scare the fish so I always just like to keep it calm and the good thing is it's not raining as much now Now along that back side, it's very deep, at least it looks very deep, I certainly can't see the bottom. And there's a nice bit of current goes along the back there, it's bringing all the food to that fish. So if I can drop this fella in the right place and just let it go down, I should catch a fish. side. Even if I'm six inches short, it's not in the right line for this particular fish. So the cast is going to have to be pretty good. If I cast a little bit too far, it's easy just to drag it back quickly before the fly gets to the fish. But if I don't cast far enough, the fish just won't look at it. It's set in that line. Another good cast. Ooh, ooh, he's going absolutely berserk. He's not happy at all. little beauty. Ooh, stay still lad, there you go, look at that fella. Absolutely glistening, loads of red spots on him as well. And there he goes, back to see his mates. Oh, and there's another one which I've lost. Lost another one. Oh, I don't know whether you can see, but about here. Well, where are we? There? Yeah, that's right. About there. There's a, a fish rising in there where all the sticks have collected. Right underneath a tree. Very difficult place to cast to. Which would make it all the sweeter if I could winkle a fish out from in there. Oh, 
what a glorious catch that was. Right at the limit of my casting. And it's another beautiful little brownie. There you have it. Red spots on them again. Lovely little fish. There you go, son. Well, I think these fellas are pretty much sick of me thrashing away here. So I'm going to move down a bit. There's one round about there, where the end of the rod tip is, across the far side. Pretty good back cast, so I should be able to reach it. It's right in the side though. The water's quite slow along the back of there, although that is the area where the current goes, I'm probably going to have to drop the fly right next to the fish, because generally in faster water, the fish need a decent time to see the fly. In slower water, you want to put it more or less on their nose, you know, so they don't want to come up and take a look and think, hey, oh, that's not a real fly. Oh, what a belter. What a belter. That just came up and took the fly calm as you like and it's practically breaking me rod. It's a decent size for this river. Yep. It's actually a stocky this one. And it took the fly right down at the back of its tongue. That's why these are so important. Not a bad fish, very golden, but you can see it's totally lacking the red spots. Let's get them back. Thank you very much, Mr. Fish. Okay, what's that? Six, seven, eight? I don't know. But they're getting bigger. Now, I would have hated to catch any of the fish that you've seen in this video on like an eight foot or a nine foot rod. They just wouldn't have given the fight. You know, this little seven foot rod, weight two. Even that last fella, you know, I mean, it's not a monster fish, but it, it really, you know, it felt exciting. Bigger rods just don't give you that excitement, unless the fish are much bigger, which they're not going to be in this river. But having said that, you know, whilst it is good to catch big fish, I would much rather catch little fish from difficult places on a nice little river using light gear than I would, you know, on a 9-10 foot rod catching, you know, 12 pound gut buckets in a reservoir. Because that, to me, just, I don't know, that's not for me. You know, rivers is where it's at. You've, yeah, you've got to work harder in rivers. Although having said that, you really don't have to work too hard to catch them during mayfly season. All you've got to do is really recognise the fact that the fish are feeding on the mayfly, match what they're feeding on, and have the ability to cast reasonably well on the river. And you'll haul them out. You know, earlier in the season or later in the season becomes a little bit more difficult because there's different flies and it's a little bit more difficult to recognize them but as long as you've got basic knowledge you can catch a lot of fish in any river it's a young dipper very good Now I've been down here about an hour and a quarter and believe it or not, that is exactly how long it took a guy I was watching the other day to get ready to go fishing. 
an hour and a quarter. I was watching him out of my office window, just sitting there working away and he's just sitting on the back of his car and he's fannying about with his reel and then his rod and then his flies and when his waders and all his gear, you know, decked out in all the gear. And I'm looking at him thinking, Christ, I could have been fishing. I could have been on the river, I could have been catching fish by now. And curiosity actually got the better of me. So I went down and um, I knew he was in the club because the club fish below this stretch, you know, this is a private pit. And uh, I said, oh, are you in the club? Oh, I am I. It's first time down this bit. He says, I'm just debating what to put on. I'm, I'm like, well, you, you want to be deciding that when you're down the river, really, you know, when you, you're looking and you're seeing what flies are out. All right, I. I said, I hope you're not going to take this the wrong way, but what the bloody hell takes you an hour and a quarter to prepare to go fishing? <laughs> you know, I mean, you could drive 40, 50 miles to go fishing in that time. And uh, he says he just likes to spend a lot of time getting ready, which I suppose I can understand, you know, you want it to be as relaxing as possible. But to me, the relaxing part isn't the getting ready, it's the actual fishing, you know. So I just literally grab my gear, sling this on, which has got basic flies, a little bit of floating, a bit of spare line in, and I'm out the door. It doesn't take me five minutes to get to the river. And I've caught maybe seven or eight fish in the time it took that guy just to get ready to go fishing. <laughs> so I found that highly amusing. I don't know what takes so long, but I will say, if that guy's watching and he recognises me, you got one thing right, and that is chest waders. I know I called the guys at the start who always wear chest waders and there's no real need, but when it's pitling down like it has been today and you're walking through long grass, getting soaked and wet, chest waders are a good idea. So you guys have it right. It's dry, no need for them. I've caught all these fish off the bank, not even wearing wellies. Just got boots on. My feet are actually dry. The water hasn't managed to get down there, but uh, every other part of me is soaking wet. So chest waders probably would have made me a little bit more comfortable. Perfect. Perfect. Devil fish. Come off. Devil. Yeah, we devils. No, they're just pecking at us. They're just pecking. Must be tiny little fish. Look, I'll never get sick of catching tiny little fish out of tiny little pools. Another beautiful little brownie. Back to see his friends. It was absolute monster here. Record breaking all the way. Well, not quite. <laughs> it's hardly any bigger than a minnow. Look at the size of that. Greedy little devil. Beautiful fish though, absolutely beautiful. Oh yes. That was
was a nice fish up there. A bit difficult for me to get to because I'm actually coming into the longest, slowest, most boring part of the river. And it gets very wide. And if I go in after that fella, I'm going to get very wet. Yeah, can I get in there? I might be able to get in, you know. I might, I might just get in. We are. Tiny little fella. Micro trout, fat micro trout. the little micro trout. another little micro trout. <laughs> and another one. Wow, that was a bit bigger, and it actually foul hooked it through the side. 
First time I've ever foul hooked the fish on the river, believe it or not. That's the one I was after. And he's going berserk. <laughs> of tangle of roots in front of me. I want to keep them away from that. Well, this one was well worth getting wet for. Oh, what an absolute beauty, beautiful fish. Now this is why we go fishing. Look at that. Absolutely beautiful wild brownie caught from a difficult place. Lovely. Get in there. Fly comes out, easy as that. And he's gonna go back. Beautiful fish, beautiful. Oh, what a way to end this session. I don't like fishing the next bit because it's wide, it's slow, it's boring. And quite frankly, in the next bit, I don't think I'm gonna to top that fish. So that's a cracking way to finish. It might have been a little bit more comfortable and certainly drier if I'd used waders to get into that river and winkle that fella out from underneath those trees. But it wouldn't have been anywhere near as enjoyable. Great stuff, love it. If you've liked this video, check out my other ones. Um, like and share it wherever you want. And if you go to the channel, scroll down, there'll be playlists for all the different subjects that I cover on my channel. There is one there which has a lot of fishing videos in. And I do apologise for not doing more fishing videos, but it's been a while since the last one. This is a good one, and what a way to end it. Absolutely over the moon. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Right, now this isn't something that's going to help you to survive in the tundra or really cold conditions. It's more like a, a medium weight, fleecy sort of smock. But it does have some very good features. It's got a really nice hood. And the inside of the hood is lined with a waterproof breathable membrane, as is the shoulder part along your back and also on the elbows as well. They're the areas of hardest wear, and they're the areas that are possibly going to get wet, so they're well protected. The fabric itself, I don't think it's, it's fully waterproof, but it's certainly showerproof. And you've got your standard two big pockets here. They don't meet in the middle, so you can kind of use them independently. And then you've got a big binocular pocket. Inside of there, you've actually got a smaller zippered pocket. If you want to keep coins or anything especially valuable in there. But the most interesting part of this whole ensemble is what's above that pocket. And it's this thing here that convinced me to buy this particular smock because I get absolutely eaten alive by midges. I must have very tasty blood. But I can keep those little buggers at bay with an anti-midge net that's actually built into this. So you basically just unroll that, zip it up, 
and give the midges the finger. Now there's no possible way they can get in. Obviously they can still get in here, but if you're getting eaten that badly, you can, <laughs> you can just tuck your hands up like that and scream at them. So there you go, the visibility out of here is absolutely excellent. And these have been developed for people who fly fish on a night for um, sea trout. You know, when you're in the dark and you're getting absolutely hammered by the midges. This keeps the mesh off your face. It, you know, it never feels oppressive. You can see straight out through it. If you're stalking and you're up on the moors and the midges are absolutely pounding you, you can still look through your scope and the midges just cannot get you. They just cannot get you once this is zipped up. And then when you've survived the midgy apocalypse and you're out of the way of where they are, you simply roll that up very, very slowly and carefully like so. And you just fasten that with press studs. One, two. There you go, all packed away. And of course you've got the normal draw cords here and also around your waist as well. It's a really, really beautiful smock. It is not cheap because these are only made in small numbers in the UK. They're not exactly made to order, but they may as well be because they aren't a mass market thing. They're a very specialized smock. But if you're a bush crafter or a fisherman, or basically somebody who just sits outside in the countryside and you're sick of getting eaten to death by midges this is what you want and because it's medium weight you can wear it any time unless it's really really hot I absolutely love it it's made by Nomad UK it's called anti-midge quad rider and I'll put the link to their site in the video description if you want to check it out be my guest I would definitely recommend it really really well made and it works that's the main thing works to keep those goddamn midges out so there you go really really nice smock and when I was fishing in this video that you've just watched every part of me was soaking apart from my shoulders and my head wait well, actually apart from anything that was in this smock my trousers my kegs my socks everything ended up being absolutely soaking. This thing actually kept me dry and you could see how, how well it wasn't exactly torrential, but how much it was raining in this video. It was very, very wet conditions. I did stay dry in this. I think there was a little wet patch on my back, but that was pretty much it because obviously I was hunched over. And the protection only goes a certain way, but it is pretty much showerproof. I don't know what more to say. Thanks for watching, see you next time.